Wednesday night, I think, which is the same as Tuesday night, the same as Thursday night, the same as Saturday night, and the same <laughs> as whatever other nights still exist uh, on a calendar, at least. Uh, this is Let's Chat and Athletic Therapy Roundtable. This is session 21. Taking off here, 748. We'll go over the ground rules. We are recording for the purposes of going back in time uh, and uh, and holding John accountable for everything that he says predictions <laughs> as to what's going to happen to the world, uh, yep, when, the Marlins, yep. when the Marlins are going to win the World Series, all these things. There you go. And, yep. uh, uh, and, uh, and going back in time to save the world one conversation at a time. Um, if you have any comments, I have a dog barking. I have no way to stop that right now. Um, so this is life in quarantine. Uh, uh, if you have any comments, questions for, for John or for myself, please feel free to type them in or, uh, or uh, unmute yourself and use the microphone and we will get rolling. I'll start with the formal, uh, as always, the formal um, bio and then jump in and we will go from here. So our first uh, Major League Baseball athlete on this evening, uh, real pleasure to have you, John. Really appreciate you taking the time out. I know things are Thanks for having me. strange and different. Yeah, and, and I'll let you say hi to everybody here in a minute once we get through your bio and, um, and give a little rundown on, on how we know each other uh, as we go. So uh, John attended Troy High School in Troy, Michigan. Now this is a long bio, and this is a long <laughs> bio intentionally. Uh, not because it's a major league baseball player, but because I think this summarizes um, a lot of people who are on this call. Um, it's analogous to a lot of people on this call in terms of where you're at in your career now, how long things might take, but when you get to that moment, um, you can really reflect back and, and, and really uh, understand that the process is a whole lot more important than the end point uh, until the end point becomes the process. So uh, anyway, let's get back to it. John attended Troy High School in Troy, Michigan, where he played for the school's baseball team. The Oakland Athletics selected uh, John Birdie in the 36th round of the 2008 Major League Baseball draft. He didn't sign at that time. He then enrolled at Bowling Green State University, where he played college baseball for the Falcons baseball team. He set, a single, he set single season records with a 423 batting average, 93 hits, pardon the barking, and tied the single season record with six triples. His 17 career triples were also a record. In 2010, he played collegiate summer baseball with the Brewster Whitecaps of the Cape Cod Baseball League. Um, uh, the Blue Jays then selected John Birdie in the 18th round in 2012. Is that right? Am I right on that year? 11. 11. 2011. 2011. Uh, the Blue Jays selected him in 2011 in the 18th round with a 559th overall selection. Um, and then in Vancouver in short season of the Northwest League, he had 23 stolen bases, hit 291, uh, 21 RBIs. In 2012, he played for the Lansing Lugnuts uh, in Class A and the Dunedin Blue Jays in High A. In 110 combined games, he hit 241 with two home runs, 40 RBIs, 34 stolen bases. In 2013, Birdie played for Dunedin, which is high A again, stole 56 bases, the most in the Florida State League. That offseason, he played in, uh, for the Canberra Cavalry in the Australian Baseball League uh, in that 2013-2014 ABL season. He stole 31 bases in 46 games, setting a record, and hit 309 with 18 RBI. He stole another four bases uh, in the 2013 Asia Series. In 2014, uh, Birdie played for New Hampshire, which is double A for the Blue Jays organization, stole 38 bases, named an all-star uh, with the Eastern League, and was assigned to the Arizona Fall League after the regular season. He set career highs in games played, 136 home runs with seven and RBI with 50. In the offseason, he played 20 games with the Mesa Solar Sox in the AFL, the Arizona Fall League, where he batted 292, hit three home runs, eight RBIs, and six stolen bases. He'd split time in 2015 with New Hampshire and then AAA Buffalo. In 103 total games, hit 249, three home runs, 34 RBI, and 23 stolen bases. He was invited to Major League Spring Training on January 12, 2016. Sort of a pivotal moment, uh, I'm sure, and we'll hear about mm -hmm. that. Uh, and reassigned to minor league camp on March 10th. He started the season with New Hampshire in AA and then was assigned to Buffalo on April 27th, played in 86 total games in 2016, uh, hit 256, uh, four home runs, 33 RBI, 36 stolen bases, 2017 with Buffalo and Dunedin, hitting 204 with three home runs, 20 RBI, 24 stolen bases in 65 games. In, 20, in uh, 2018, in April, he was traded to the Cleveland Indian organization for cash considerations, he appeared in 25 games for the AAA Columbus Clippers before being traded back to the Blue Jays on June 8th. The Blue Jays promoted Birdie to the major leagues on September 26, 2018, inserted him into the starting lineup that day at second base. Another extremely 
proud moment, I'm sure. Not that you didn't yeah. have a bunch of them along the way. Uh, he was designated for assignment on October 5th and outrighted a AAA Buffalo on October 9th. He elected for free agency in November of 2018. In December of 2018, he signed a minor league contract with the Mi Miami Marlins and was invited to spring training. He opened the 2019 season with maybe one of the best names in the league, New Orleans <laughs> Baby Cakes. On April 20th, his contract was selected and he was called up to the major league roster. He hit his first major league home run on May 6th in a 6-5 win for the Marlins. <clears throat> in 2019, he hit 273 with six home runs, led the Marlins with 17 stolen bases in 73 games. He also demonstrated his defensive versatility as a rookie with 20 games played at, as a third baseman, 21 games as a center fielder, and 32 games as a shortstop. Birdie became the first player in Marlins history with 20 plus games at each of those positions in the same season. John Birdie, uh, I appreciate you being on here. The, the Bible, yeah. uh, it tells a lot, and I think we can get into any one of those seasons as we go, but I'll let you say hi to everybody and, and really appreciate you being here this evening and, and spending some time. So, uh, no, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, hi to everyone who's able to, to join on. It's, uh, it's cool to see and, um, yeah, just hearing you list off a lot of that just, you know, reminds me of, of the journey that it's taken to, to get to this point, obviously, and a lot of ups and a lot of downs, but, uh, but we're here. Yeah, man. And, uh, I really appreciate you being here. Haven't seen you since, uh, uh I don't know, tried, I, I heard you were getting called up because I know some people with the organization mm -hmm. still when you were with the Jays and, mm -hmm. uh, and we were away at the time or else I would have been trying to knock down the door to say hi. And I feel like it's been a few years. Yeah. Um, probably when you came to Buffalo, maybe one time to, um, to visit some, maybe Dowsey or something like that. Um, I feel like we ran into each other once or twice along the way there, but yeah, it's been, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time together in 2012 though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So 2012, this is where we got to know each other was in Lansing, Michigan, um, in the Midwest league, uh, not a lot of time in the training room. Um, but lots of time, obviously, uh, with mm -hmm. the family that becomes uh, teammates, staff mm -hmm. members, and all of that in baseball. Your story is one that has uh, so many um, uh, on-ramps and off-ramps. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's crucial for a lot of people to see, and it's analogous with a lot of people's careers. You know, sometimes when we're talking with pro athletes, um, and first of all, giving us insight into your life is, is uh, uh, really appreciate that. So we don't need to get into too many personal things. But in your, in your, professional, uh, in your professional career, you know, um, so many, like I mentioned, like, you know, up, down, over there, over there, back here again. And how did you manage to sort of stick to uh, nose to the grindstone and, and get to where you're at now? Like what, what, what goes on in your head to, to keep you sort of uh, middle or, or level headed? Yeah. I mean, I would be, you know, lying if I said that there was ever a, a chance that I wasn't, you know, didn't think about giving up or giving in. But, um, you know, early in my career, it was a little easier for the most part because I, I played well early on and I felt like I was moving up um, at a pretty good pace. Um, so my goal was always to be into the big leagues by the time I was 25 years old. And obviously, I didn't make my debut until I was 28. So there's a little bit of a gap there. And I think those years between... Um, when I was in my mid twenties going on into my later twenties that, you know, that, that was when it was really difficult and, and could be very stressful. But, um, what I kind of always told myself is, Hey, if, if they give you a Jersey, you have an opportunity. If you have an opportunity, then, then I'm going to keep going for it until, until that opportunity is not there anymore. So that was kind of my mindset is you got a Jersey, you got a chance. Um, so I just keep working and, and see what happens because, you know, at the end of the day, I would never want to look back on my my career and my life and think you know what what could have happened I would have rather not succeeded by giving it all I had and if I just didn't have it I just didn't have it the opportunity had passed me by um, I could live with that but I wouldn't live with the fact that it'd be tough to live with the fact that um, maybe I left something on the table there yeah and and for you know for a young guy younger guy uh, still, even though yeah, you're yeah. a little bit later than, than you wanted it to be or anticipated, anticipated it to be, um, to hear you speak about that, like you're, you're I, we, all of the guests that we've had on have talked about, you know, mistakes uh, and not necessarily that you've made mistakes, but uh, I'm sure I've made plenty. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah, but like even if the way that you look at it, your perspective is, is sort of like there's setbacks along the way, but there's always something to learn from those. Mm -hmm. uh, 
what, what were some of the, the things that you learned in some of the conversations? Like as you're getting sent down or moved up, um, are those dialogues pretty clear in terms of why and things that you have to work on or, or were some of them pretty muddy along the way? And you don't have to get into specifics. Of uh, a little bit of both. Um, there definitely were times where um, I felt like um, I was playing well enough or I was put myself in a position to um, be in a better spot than what I was. Um, and so that could be frustrating, especially as you know, with uh, especially with baseball being so many levels to the minor league system and um, certain guys get called up sometimes or sent down and um, it can be confusing because then you see another a, a, another guy with similar stats or whatever getting called up and you're thinking well I'm as good or if not better than that guy but why is he getting called up so I, I learned early on to not give in or, or, or look into that kind of stuff too much um, to learn to control what I can control and what I can control is my effort and my attitude so if I came to the park every day with a good attitude being a good teammate and, and worked as hard as I could, that's what I could control. And, and baseball is a game of a, a lot of lack of control where um, you can do everything right and not get a hit that day or, or, you know, different things like that. So you learn very quickly to focus on the things you can control and, and do those to the best of your ability. Um, and, and do that, like I said, yeah, do that to the best of your ability every day. Cause it's, it's tough to come to the yard every day when, you know, you play 150, 160 games um, if you're not doing those things right. Yeah, uh, amazing to hear you say that, um, controlling what you, you know, working with what you can control and leaving the other stuff to sort of fall by mm -hmm. or where it's going to fall. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's massive. And so for anybody who doesn't know John or, or you want to get to know John, this is a guy who um, definitely not a wallflower in terms of being on the background, like always a hard worker, first to the field, uh, stayed there for long. And I'm talking just from the time that I, that I knew you. Mm -hmm. um, not big in stature, but certainly like in, in heart and hustle and, and all the intent tangible things that that aren't uh, on the back of a baseball card you entail all of those things and I think that would be, I appreciate it um, yeah hey man you earned it there's uh, <laughs> all of these things are um, uh, are are things that can't be uh, uh, can't be traded but they also can't be stamped on the back of a, a baseball card and captured mm -hmm. the fact that you've been up down all around been on mul in multiple organizations and are now you know hopefully as, as if the season comes comes back around this year uh, or in the future um, yep. a mainstay in the big leagues because that's a thing that, that every younger player can learn from and I think people in all mm -hmm. facets of life can learn from stick to um, you know the I think the Red Sox came up with and we had George Poulos on here a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. awesome about, yeah 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 talked about being a dirt bag uh, as a trainer you know just like always mm -hmm. yeah yeah for sure music. and the Red Sox talked about it from a player standpoint I think they're the first organization um, John's the kind of guy who, who would who would run through a wall and probably has a few in his career uh, to make a play or, or for a teammate or in support of the game or to win or to do these things. And, and things are uh, yeah, amazing characteristics, amazing traits. I, I never told you at the time when we were working together that those are the things that I admired about you and, and you inspire people like us, you know, trainers in the room, strength coaches, um, you're the type of person that, that we want to be around, the type of people that we want to be. So I'll express that to you again. Like this, this platform for me is also uh, on a personal note to thank all those people who have impacted me in this career. I appreciate it. That means a lot. It means yeah. a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah. But it means a lot that you're here and having this conversation and, and everything that you do to lead by example. Um, you're the second person uh, I've heard. We are uh, working in the Bahamas, but we're now back in Canada uh, because we left to, to get back. But uh, we were watching the, the, the graduation uh, for the grade 12s. They're just graduating and they had to do like this virtual thing and, and the IT department and everybody worked nicely to make it uh, virtual, but, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but live. So all the graduates were in one place and they were, the, the valedictorian was talking about change and how this is an opportunity for, uh, for us to change. And if we don't take the opportunity to, uh, to do something different or to change something about us and we come out of this thing, hoping for things to go back to normal. Um, mm -hmm. You haven't really done a good job in terms of growing. So um, what, what have you been doing? Let's get away from baseball for a second. What have you been doing in terms of like uh, outside of baseball? Have you picked up anything new? I don't know, play the ukulele or something with Zoom? <laughs> no, uh, not quite. I'm not very uh, musically gifted. I love music, but uh, not very musically gifted. But um, coming out of this, uh, I completely agree with what you're saying too. And um, I've in the past... Um, worked on meditating and things like that. So I'm really had more opportunity to really kind of dive into that a little bit more just because um, 
I think it's it'll be tremendous help for uh, my baseball game anyways, just being more mindful, being more in the moment and being present um, as best I can. But I think it just also helps so much in life because especially nowadays with technology and your phone and so many ways to con connect, contact people and, and, and so many things going on, we get so distracted that we're never fully in the moment. And so it's very, very difficult to do, but um, doing my best to, to work on that and to kind of just remind myself um, as things are going on, when different thoughts creep up that, Hey, get back to, get back to the moment, get back to what you're doing. This is the only important thing right now. Anything else um, will be important when you get to it. So been really working on that. Um, outside of that, I mean, haven't been able to do a whole lot, just uh, trying to stay in shape and as best I can and um, hitting and um, trying to spend time with family as, you know, as best we can and as safe as we can as well. So, I'm just trying to take advantage of the time I have with them too. Yeah, awesome, and and you look great. So I, I know uh, looks Thanks. aren't always everything, but uh, <laughs> uh, the beard looks good. I think we were anti-beard back in the day. You didn't have one. Maybe you were too young. Wasn't allowed. I wasn't yeah, allowed. Yeah. I don't think I could have grown it like this though. Yeah. Not, not not back then. <laughs> yeah, it looks good, man. It looks good. Um, and and you talk about mindfulness, and you talk about uh, meditation, and these kinds of things, and centering yourself. With now, I have this conversation. I think on a daily basis with our five-year-old. Uh, just about mm -hmm. making choices and and you know if you can you, you can get really upset with things right now uh, or you can just take a couple breaths and like let's think about this is it worth getting mm -hmm. upset about or is it worth just like let's move to something else and come back to it or or can we really think our way through this and, and control mm -hmm. the things that we can control really really powerful stuff um uh brings me to the the, the netflix question uh um the last dance is obviously massive and, and like getting uh -huh. into Michael Jordan and what he's been doing and these kinds of things or was doing at the time. Um, used a lot of that practice, but ha have you watched Tiger King? I don't know if it has mind. Yes, you? I have. I have. We, uh, my girlfriend and I uh, binge watched that rather quickly. So unfortunately that took up maybe just the first week of quarantine. And after that, we were already done with it. So <laughs> this is, this is it. Uh, we're getting, uh, I just put this in the chat just only because uh, this is a running tally and it's starting to be yeses at the, at the high end. I think that's like a five point mm. for the yeses in these chats. And, um, and everybody kind of be like, move on, dude. Like you stop talking about Tiger King. That was like week two. <laughs> Get over it and move on. But I'm not. I'm going to stick with the question for every guest that comes on just because I think. I'm sure you've seen it, right? I haven't, man. I have not watched this. You scene. haven't. I haven't even watched the trailer. I haven't even read what it's about on Netflix. It's, it's, it's crazy. The, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. For anyone who's seen it, it's just, you can't make it up. I don't know. It's, it's, it's wild. Yeah, I, I I feel like if I started watching it, I'd be in trouble or or I'd die <laughs> one way or the other. It's too extreme. I'm yeah, just gonna off and I'll just keep asking the question until uh, I don't know until I fall off the edge. I guess <laughs> like uh, Netflix just goes kaboom. Um, Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so let's um, the Marlins now. That ballpark mm -hmm. is a place where uh, if this quarantine, if this thing hadn't happened, we were planning on. I was planning on flying and then driving anyway. Um, back from Bahamas, and I was going to mm -hmm. make basically. I was going to knock on your door and say, "Hey, can can I get some?" Would have been great. Absolutely. How, how is that stadium? It looks a little crazy on TV. How, how does it play? How does it feel in terms of a, a big league field, big league park? I mean, it's awesome. The playing surface itself is really cool. But um, starting this year, actually, the dirt's going to be the same. But we have the new um, turf that it's supposed to be like the newest one um, that is supposed to be the closest to grass as possible. Um, the Arizona Diamondbacks have it. Uh, and we actually played in Arizona last year. Um, and so it's very similar to kind of the way the Rogers Center was or is, but it's not as bouncy and they don't use like the rubber pellets. It's more of like a, I don't know what, it, it's not dirt, but it's something more that's supposed to be safer and, and better for you and stuff. So I was really curious about how that was going to go. And like I said, hopefully this year we were able to get back out there and I can kind of test it out. But the stadium itself is beautiful. It's a retractable roof. Um, it's very big. Uh, we actually are moving the outfield uh, center field wall in maybe about 10 feet or so. Um, but it's still a pretty big park, um, which plays to to my strengths a little bit with, with my speed and um, got a chance to play some center field out there last year, which was really cool. And um, yeah, anytime we have a good crowd going, you know, it's, it's fun to be at and that's fun atmosphere. And um, Miami's a cool city. So, 
again, luckily we have that retractable roof because of how hot it gets and, and the rain, especially around this time of year, it's usually pretty rainy. So um, we're able to just close that pretty quickly if we need to, or have it open for, for a nice, nice Miami night. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks cool. Like it's like a, I don't know when they first opened it, they made it look like a theme park a little bit um, with yeah, a yeah. Going on in there and, and wherever yeah. Miami is a, a beautiful part of the, of the world. Um, minus the hurricanes and rainy season. So retractable roof goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you talk about your speed and, and sort of utilizing your, uh, your qualities uh, to get you mm -hmm. where you are and keep you where you are. Um, how do you, how do you train or how do you keep your, your sort of speed at the forefront of like, what do you do differently than maybe uh, uh, a pitcher or somebody like that in terms of training or what do you do for speed? How do you train that? Uh, and is that guided yeah. by your staff or is that you? Yeah. Um, when I was with the Blue Jays, uh, they did a great job of, of putting together kind of our off season program. And then obviously in season um, doing the different things to stay, stay ready on a daily basis. Um, Marlins have done the same thing and I've kind of just continued to follow that guideline of my off season workout, try to just replicate it. Um, but for me, it's, it's, I'm a big believer in, um, if you train fast, you'll be fast. If you train slow, you'll be slow. So I don't really do as much distance type running, um, as a lot of pitchers do. I would rather do a lot of short, high energy, high intensity, quick um, agility drills or sprint work um, because I feel like the more I train my body to to move fast and be fast, I will be be fast. So uh, a mix of that with different, just making sure to work on my soft tissue, um, soft tissue work, whether it's with uh, foam roll or uh, getting, you know, in different grungy areas with the lacrosse ball or um, different things like that definitely have helped to keep my flexibility side of it too. Um, which I think is so key to go along with the strength side. So um, I have my dog here who's trying to say hi right now. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's this is this is life. Right? This is hey, look at that little Frenchie. That's Nola. Yeah. Yep, little Frenchie. Cool. Nice. Yep. <laughs> but a couple, uh, a couple of those ones walking by resulted in some big barks today on this end. Like I was mentioning, and there was a couple Frenchies that went by. So uh, no. I'm sure. I'm sure. I just can't see through, I don't know, two dimensions. She doesn't really – I've only heard her bark once, actually, so she doesn't really bark, which is good. But, uh, but yeah, so um, doing different things like that has definitely helped uh, maintain my speed but also um, has gotten me quicker and, and faster over the years because I obviously I was always I, – I know speed is a big part of my game, obviously, and um, I want to be able to maximize it. So I kind of realized also at a young age to – you people sometimes get so wrapped up in improving on your weaknesses that you kind of neglect your strengths a little bit. So um, I got some advice before and, and you always want to improve your weaknesses when you can, but you also need to keep your strengths, your strengths, because that's what sets you apart from, from other players or other individuals. Yeah. Amazing advice to hear from somebody who's playing at the highest level, because uh, a lot of times coaches and, and anecdotally or experientially and therapists or practitioners um, will go the other way. And sometimes, you know, I, I found through conversation and dialogue that there, there isn't, there are times when change needs to happen, but there's also mm -hmm. times when you don't need to, you don't need to fix what's not broken. So overworking mm -hmm. and overtraining or overreaching, trying to make either everybody look the same or do the same drills or mm -hmm. whatever, uh, sometimes falls on uh, on deaf ears that we shouldn't be doing that. Um, it sounds like you, you've had a ton of good practitioners and, and strength coaches, uh, and I know some of them. Uh, mm -hmm. I, and I think Drew's still on here, so he'll count as a good one. He might have he might have. Oh yeah, he, he's still there, so we'll count him as a good one. Um, he, What's he up, Drew? Me, so I was. Uh, hey Bert, how are you? <laughs> good man. Good to hear good. your voice. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah, so so definitely some good ones along the way, and and some uh, some average Absolutely. ones along the way. Um, uh, what have you found with with strength and conditioning personnel and sort of the performance side, uh, inclusive mm -hmm. of ATCs trainers, um, that's really worked well in the baseball world in terms of I don't know characteristics or um, uh, personality, let's say uh, uh, from yeah. A yeah yeah. I've been very blessed and fortunate when it comes to my different um, strength coaches and athletic trainers, just having just really good people. And, and like you said, you know, a lot of them and majority of the ones that I've ever dealt with were with the Blue Jays and now even with the Marlins, um, just a lot of great people and, and people who 
I think as players, what we really, really want is, is number one is communication. I think that is so huge um, to be able to communicate what um, a player, uh, his thoughts and feelings on certain things or how his body's feeling um, and being able to um, have those conversations with, with that kind of, with your staff um, as well as I think players want to know that they that they care right they want to know that their manager cares if they're a hitter I want to know that my hitting coach cares um, athletic uh, trainer and strength coach it goes the same way where if I know you care and you have my I believe you have my best interests at heart there's such a awesome trust factor that go that becomes from that and that you're able to develop that relationship so if I come to the field one day and I'm I'm like hey hey James or uh, go to a strength coach let's say and say hey man like um my my cat's kind of bugging me today. I know we got this kind of work in. Like, is there any way we can can modify it a little bit or, or whatever, and and we can have a conversation to where then I feel comfortable um, with how things are going, and and I don't feel like um, you know I'm being attacked or, or or whatever. So I think I think communication um, and I think um, building that relationship um, develops a lot of trust amongst you, and and I think those are a lot of things that I really have enjoyed with most all of my strength coaches and athletic trainers, and I've been very fortunate for it. Yeah, wow. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a massively critical area to ask our athletes uh, what works and doesn't work, and that answer just encapsulates so much and um, appreciate the depth of it, and, and it's not something you had to think about in terms of you know mm -hmm. what works, you know what doesn't as an mm -hmm. athlete. Um, we've talked with a lot of different practitioners on here and, and that's kind of been our running theme, to be honest. It's just been, uh, if we can figure out a way, if we can ask the right questions to get to know John Birdie a little bit better on a daily basis, regardless of his baseball pro S or the position he's playing or, or what, you know, just understanding which sock you put on first. It allows us mm -hmm. to know, a little bit, you know, allows us to know, I think it's still the left, but um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, but if it's, if there's one thing that we can pick up on a daily basis to build that trust factor, uh, that goes a massively long way, uh, both ways, you know, because mm -hmm. you're going to come and you're going to trust in us and we're going to trust that you're going to let us know when there's things that, that are hampering you or you don't like, or whatever those things, uh, those things like, do you, do you find that there's uh, um, uh, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to say the wrong terms. I don't want to lead you the wrong way, but uh, is there still some dynamics within baseball, uh, where people won't go to trainers or won't go to strength coaches on teams that you've been on? I think, I think it's gotten a lot better over the years. And I think the teams I've been on it, it like I said, I've been very fortunate to, to have very good ones, um, great ones. And so I think that has helped to where, like you talked about, so then the trust that I have where, if my calf is bothering me, I can come to you and say, hey, calf's kind of bugging me. I can still play, but can we do a little something to help alleviate it without feeling like you're going to immediately shut me down and say, well, you can't play tonight. And then, you know, but we can work through it as opposed to me just saying, acting like everything's fine because I don't, let, let's say I didn't trust in the process and I, I just go out there and play instead and don't get the proper treatment. And then all of a sudden I, I blow out my calf and then I'm missing a lot more time than, than what would have been needed. So I'm sure it still goes on a little bit just because, you know, there's still a little bit of that uh, stigma or mentality of being, you know, a tough guy and don't want to, you know, come off weak or don't want the team to think that, you know, I'm in the training room all the time. Um, but I think it's gotten a lot better over the years where guys are more willing to say, Hey, listen, like I still want to play, but I need a little bit of help in this area, which I think helps in the long term, long run too. Yeah, yeah, and and you bring it up, and and um, it's obviously more than anecdotal. It's experiential for you, and you've been on a lot of teams. You've been in a lot of different levels with a lot of different personnel, and I think that bodes uh, so well for everybody that's on here as a practitioner or, or just anybody viewing. Is is there's a lot of experience here, and and to not take the athlete's word uh, for, for gospel, for lack of a better term, just doesn't make sense. There has to be a lot of stock put in what you're telling me mm -hmm. when I'm asking you how you're feeling and can you go for me to determine, can you, or can't you go without 
really anything concrete doesn't make much sense. Mm -hmm. So that comes back to that trust factor. Um, obviously, from a clinical standpoint, we would need to, to understand how the cap functions for what you do, your position, how you bat, run, do these things, uh, throw, um, and, and then to make that decision with you as opposed to for you, um, especially at the major league level. One thing I found in the minor leagues, and that's only where I spent, you know, I spent some limited weeks in the, with the major league team, but um, mm -hmm. with in the minor leagues is there was a lot of guys at the lower levels that would kind of push things aside and not tell us about them for, for fear of, you know, being labeled as that guy mm -hmm. who's complaining or, or mm -hmm. that um, not making kind of excuses or. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, there was always, you know, looking back on, on my career um, and in those years, I wish I had had more conversations with guys about, you know, how you're feeling and, and, and let's have these discussions. But I also found that um, as the year went on and as guys saw the interactions with, with the strength and conditioning and the, and the performance personnel, mm -hmm. that, that trust gets built um, based on, you know, uh, Dowsey and me going into uh, uh, Walmart and doing the 12 minute shop to make sure we had the right peanut butter and the, and the, right, the, the right, I don't know, cheap oh. prices or whatever. I just look back on those days and I just like, we had a great that. group there. Yeah. 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 Do, do you still talk to anybody from, from those, uh, from that team? Yeah. Um, I, I talked to Andy Burns quite a bit. Him and I are close. Um, he's back with the Blue Jays um, in AAA. He was in that big league camp. That Tom Burnsy. He's yes, there. exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't forget that. Um, <laughs> I keep in touch with Shane Opitz. Um, okay. He's not playing anymore. He's an assistant coach at a, I think it's Northern Colorado um, University. Um, still lives in the Denver area. Um, run into, you know, I run into Kevin Pilar every now and then, and, and we text a little bit sometimes. Um, trying to think, uh, Kevin Patterson. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. He's actually my financial advisor. <laughs> yeah, and a, and a big guy. What a guy. Big boy, big boy. Yeah. Um, but a few other guys probably here or there, but those are probably the, the ones I'm closest to. Okay, cool. Very cool. Um, I was just kind of scanning. I I'm so bad with phones that I think I've, uh, since, since Lansing, I think I probably had, uh, I don't know, eight or 10 phones and they're all broken and the same thing happens. <laughs> I can't find the case that can, that can hold me. At this point, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to break back into my BlackBerry from that then because I took uh, a bunch of pictures in my phone that I really want to get back just to recall like uh, photos and memories from that time. I, I remember. Anyway, I was just talking to um, I don't think it was the same year, but you were in the organization at the same time with Marcus Connect, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I yeah. still uh, once in a while we, we talk and catch up and stuff. Yeah, I love Connect. Okay, yeah. So, so he, we message back and forth, and our common ground is like uh, JD. So, uh, Dowski and I are very, very close, and Marcus and him are, are talking on a regular basis. But uh, the other day, he messaged me, and he's like, "Hey, are you back?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'm back. I'm in Toronto." And he's like, "Where in Toronto?" And I told him where we're living, and he lives like just, just, just like five minutes from here. So we're gonna go. No on, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on Tuesday, awesome. on Tuesday, we're gonna go to the park, and my son who snuck down actually two floors and is now lying on the floor over here. Um, <laughs> and, and me are, are we're going to go play catch with, with Marcus in the park. Up That's the awesome. The house on, uh, That's so awesome. The afternoon. So it'll be cool. Um, That's oh, cool. In here. Hi. Hey, so what's up? There he is. He's just uh, sneaking down to say hi. Right. Um, yeah. So, so really I'm cool. Okay, go back in your pillow bed. Sorry, <laughs> there's nothing we can do. Everybody's on uh, Zoom calls right now, and uh, we got a pillow bed over here on the floor amidst all Perfect. the topics down here. But yeah, super cool. You meet a lot of cool people along the way, and and teammates mm -hmm. go, teammates last. You know, it becomes your, it becomes your, your, your. Well, for lack of a better term, it becomes your family. You know, you're so yeah. close uh, with time and travel and all those things. Um, how do you how do you balance? in terms of your life when uh uh i'm gonna ask this as a two-party question so let me ask this uh, <laughs> mine just does this every time i start thinking <laughs> you can see bear with us too. um how do you balance when a regular season is going on uh you, your life away from baseball how does that work you obviously have to have a good support system yeah i'm so fortunate with with my amazing family and 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 friends and uh, girlfriend that i have and and how supportive they are and how understanding they are of the toll that this career kind of takes on your life, just from uh, time consuming um, your focus, your energy, you have to do so much to, to be able to be successful in this game. Um, and so they all understand that um, 
really, really well. And, and so, um, you know, a lot of times friends or, or stuff, we don't, aren't able to catch up as much as we would during the off season. But like I said, they know that. And, um, when we do catch up, it's, it's awesome and, and, and it's great, but usually a lot of that has to unfortunately stay in the off season. But, um, uh, my family does a great job of, of coming to visit too. Um, they love, um, love the game of baseball and love watching me play. So, um, they've, my parents have seen me basically play in baseball almost every stadium that I've ever played in really. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that's a big part of it too. And, and they really enjoy the travel and, and to, to get away a little bit. Yeah. And, 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 and based on your career in terms of like uh, all the places you've been and, and uh, for anybody who's not familiar, baseball's off season is, is fairly long, but not after a, a long and grueling season outdoors mm-hmm. in the summer heat with uh, all the time you spend on the field, aside from, especially in the minor leagues, big leagues too, but in the minor leagues, you're spending so many hours uh, above and beyond just gameplay on the field, at the stadium, in the gym, these kinds of things. And then you went on for multiple seasons um, through your career to play more baseball in the off season. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you feel like continually playing really helps you um, sort of stay up and keep up? Or are you at a point now where you're like, yeah, I'm going to use the off season for something a little bit different. I think uh, both, Um, especially um, younger in my career. I think it helped me to develop quicker um, and to, to improve in a lot of areas that um, needed to be improved in to, in order to get to the big leagues. Um, So I took full advantage of that, especially being young. It was really awesome to, to go, play and live in Australia for four months and to be able to explore that country and how beautiful it was and a great experience that was. And, um, and then the following year going to the Arizona fall league where um, playing with the best, you know, prospects in, in major league baseball and the competition, which is awesome to really put yourself up against that and, and see, see what, see where you're at in your career. Um, but yeah, now, especially the last few years, um, the off season's gotten a little shorter just because the big league season's longer and stuff. So um, I've just really focused on taking a little time to myself and um, be able to spend that time with family and friends and, and to rest and recover a little bit more um, and then start to build my body back up for, for the long season, I think is also equally as important. Yeah. And, and we had Frosty on and Boone on and George on from a trainer's perspective. Um, Baseball is, I don't know if it's, it's got to be probably the most, I'm not overreaching here, but it's got to be the most uh, affected by this time, I think, Um, the COVID times and everything being Mm -hmm. shut down based on like uh, um, schedule and calendaring Mm -hmm. and these kinds of things. Because for people who haven't worked in baseball, it is such a rigid calendar. Like you're at, uh, we're at June 10th which would put mm-hmm. you probably somewhere around game, I don't know, 50 of the season at this point. Yeah. 40-ish, Something. Yeah. somewhere in there. And every day you're used to, you know, you know, flying every six to eight days, mm-hmm. uh, another city, coming back, going on the road, doing these things. Uh, the adjustment to staying home has got to be really hard. Like I think of, of somebody like uh, – I mean, you're pretty close to it now. Like, like I was talking to Boone and Frosty and, and George, like their lifer is in the game, you know? So you're used yeah. to routine, 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 routine. Mm-hmm. Has this been like, has this been, and I know you talked about the mental side of things in terms of training your, training your brain and training your mentality to sort of just stick with what you can control. Ha- has it been really tough for you in terms of like just spending that much time together with your girlfriend, with your dog, with the things that you're not typically used to in these months? Has it been tough for you? It's actually been been really really good overall. I think because I'm sticking to a, a typical off season routine. So obviously I'm not able to. We haven't been able to go out to dinner or do some different things or travel like what we we like to do during the off season. But keeping my schedule, my workout plan, the workouts that I'm doing, and, and different things like that, keeping that as consistent as possible with the off season, it's helped me to make it still feel like a little bit of the off season. Um, obviously it's still been really difficult because, you know, I didn't think things were going to last as long as they had, you know, when they shut things down, I was like, just yeah. not knowing much, I guess, about the situation. I was like, because I'm so focused on, on playing and, and I was so focused on spring training and, and the ramping up for, for a big league season that you kind of, I thought, okay, I'll be home for a couple of weeks, maybe a month at most. And then, you know, back at it. Um, obviously we're going on what uh, month three. 
Yeah. So, right. Yeah, maybe. April, May, June. Yeah. Getting into three. Four. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So no. um, that's been, that's been tough because um, obviously, like you said, so used to that strict routine of, you know, going different places and, and, and playing and being at the field all day and seeing my teammates and stuff like that. That's definitely been, been a, a big transition, but overall, I mean, for, for what a lot of people are going through um, during this time, I mean, I can't say anything, but it's been, it's been good. Yeah. All right. Well, good to hear. And, and I'm glad that that's a, that's a positive for you. Uh, I just, I, I just scanned to see where Drew was at his camera's off, but I, I'm just <laughs> guessing he's working on like rotator cuff stuff and like uh, some mobility work with his kid while he's home. Oh, absolutely. Trying to stay up on, uh, on whatever it is that he's doing in the, in the Jays organization from uh, there he is. Look at him. He's outside right now working on his, uh, his garbage. It's garbage day. Garbage day. Okay. All right. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know rotator cuff garbage or something like pick it up with the right muscles <laughs> right there you go um but uh yeah tough 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 getting away from the game for this much time i'm sure um but hopefully again we can get back to that i i, I haven't watched any of it but i saw korea has like stuffed animals in the crowd in the stadium <laughs> i did see that too um, yeah and no calls yet from the Marlins asking you to send your favorite stuffies or no <laughs> not yet yeah. waiting for that call waiting for that, that along calls. with the. Uh, yeah, along with uh, when we're ready to ramp up again or head to spring training 2.0. But but uh, I'll try to pick some good ones out and bring them down for him too. All right, let us know because uh, we're big into um, making sure the things we're not using anymore, we're going to donate and somebody else can use. So we got some extras if you need some. There extras. you go. Perfect. <laughs> you, do have, uh, you do have a couple extra fans up this way too, just to let you know and reiterate that. If and when the season gets going, I'm going to catch you live at a big league stadium, 100%. I don't know if it'll be in Miami, but uh, maybe up this way. Um, well, hopefully. I mean, the way they were kind of talking about the divisions, there was a chance that they do. I don't know if what they're going to do. They haven't said anything, but there was a rumor about having three divisions and kind of separating the country into thirds. Yeah. And so I, the way they've made it look, Toronto was in our division. So that'd be really cool to, if we end up playing this year, to fly up to – playing playing the roger center again <laughs> yeah from from uh from the other side from the other dugout which would be exactly uh, yeah which would be yeah. Interesting. Uh, i always mm -hmm. love i love that now looking back like we had so much talent yourself included in, in the lansing years that now we look through the big leagues and there's so many guys from that blue jay organization when mm -hmm. you came, you know 2011 and those drafts and 10 11 mm -hmm. 12 um, that are in the big leagues now. It, 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 super cool. I'm sure you run into all those guys. You know, Carlos is playing uh, with the Oregon oh, yeah. Bank and yeah. uh, a whole bunch of guys across the big leagues. So super cool to be on the other side and just kind of that journey that's been, uh, you know, wherever you end up, you end up. But here you are. Your, your journey is one, like I mentioned earlier, that started, uh, started and then you turned down being drafted, right, by the A's the first time mm -hmm. to go to college. Uh, and then got drafted again, high, higher, I think, by the Blue Jays afterwards yep. in 2011. Um, what was that process like for you in terms of decision-making to turn it down with the A's? And then the second time around with the Blue Jays, how does that work as a, as a player, if you can go back uh, in time? So when I, when I got drafted out of high school, I really wasn't expecting to get drafted. So it was actually a really cool moment. It was really awesome to, to be drafted. I had a really good senior year in, in high school, but, you know, I never was – told by any scouts or anything that I was, you know, being, uh, had a chance to be drafted. So that was really cool. But, um, in talking with, with the scout that had drafted me and, um, they weren't going to be able to offer a whole lot of money to me being such a late round. So, um, I thought it was the best interest for, for my future to, um, uh, go to school and, and take the scholarship, uh, at Bowling Green, which, uh, and then the goal was to play there for three years and get drafted in a position after my junior year. Um, to be able to to leave school maybe early. And fortunately, I had a really good, I had a great experience um, for those three years at Bowling Green. And I was able to uh, get drafted by the Blue Jays in the 18th round. And and uh, then that's when I was able to start my pro ball career. I was actually talking to someone um, the other day about about this too, about the differences between the, the draft day with draft day come, or today, actually tonight, um, the MLB draft is going on. And so someone had asked me of being drafted twice and it was just weird how the first time I was drafted, it was super exciting because it came out of nowhere. I had no expectations and it was awesome. The second time I was drafted, it was draft day. I still remember um, by the Blue Jays, it was stressful and it was more because of my expectations were 
I was going to be a top 10. I was going to get drafted between, they were telling me between it rounds eight and 10, maybe 11 at the latest. And all of a sudden round 11 came 12, 13, all of a sudden 15 and I hadn't been drafted yet. And so that was more of a, um, a stressful time. And I still remember going, um, my dad and I were sitting by the computer and he's like, Hey, let's just, let's just go outside. And, and him and I just kind of shot hoops to kind of get away from it a little bit and just to kind of re you know center myself and that's when I got a call from the Blue Jays um, just before the 18th round and they asked you know if I would be willing to sign for so and so if if they draft me and I just told them hey I just want an opportunity I'm you know just ready to play ready to move to the next level and with the very next pick the the Blue Jays took me. Amazing and and to, to walk us through that uh, what a cool story and and you even bring up in that some some parallels to um, you know, to, to therapists and to people who aren't necessarily, uh, you know, athletes waiting to get drafted, but just waiting for either that next step or, or the job or trying to find the right fit in terms of where they're working. So um, some really cool stuff. Sometimes our expectations uh, really enhance, you know, the stress levels and those kinds of things. And I'm coming mm -hmm. back around full circle to your, to your statement earlier about, you know, centering yourself and, and controlling the controllable and leaving the rest to fall where it may. Has that made its way into into baseball at all? Mindfulness, meditation, these kinds of things, uniformly, or is that a personal choice? Um, it's a personal choice, but I think it, it's definitely. I've talked to more guys and in, in in myself doing it and um, enjoying it. Um, I've talked to other teammates who have tried it. Some have liked it. Some haven't. Um, and teams have encouraged um, different things like that. The brief time I was with the the um, Indians for the couple months I was there in AAA, um, we had uh, someone come in and kind of talk to the team a little bit about um, some different techniques to, for recovery purposes um, for, you know, to help promote your sleep and help. I think that's kind of really getting into the game a lot more um, yeah. too is recovery than even it was when I first got drafted and um, meditation and mindfulness was, was one of the things they talked about that can help um, really recharge you and, um, and things like that. So I think, I think baseball, um, and I believe other sports too, are starting to kind of move in that direction of rest and recovery and, and not only for your body, but for your mind as well. Yeah. Uh, amazing. It's a, it's a central component that, uh, I think more and more has, has come to the forefront again. And like in these times too, you know, we really have to check in with ourselves and, and with what our expectations are on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as like overall where we're trying to get to mm -hmm. and have those, those inner dialogues, uh, and, uh, and outward dialogues as well with those that we support and those that we live with and all those kinds of things. So, uh, really cool stuff. Glad to hear that you're, you're into that. I spent, uh, um, just to update you, because I don't think I told you, but I spent a, a month at an ashram in the Bahamas in, uh, oh, wow. in 2019, and, and I'm now, you know, I don't want to say yoga instructor, but have implemented <laughs> have implemented um, uh, yoga philosophy into into my living and into my routines, and and it's gone a long way in terms of enhancing uh, uh, my outlook, um, my repertoire in terms of the way that I see athletes and recovery and training. So it's, uh, not, not that everybody, it's not for everybody to do physical yoga, but the, the, the mentality of it all to tie mm -hmm. back into that central, that central purpose of, of getting a little bit more introspective. Uh, That's really cool. Certainly. Yeah. It's been, it's resonated with me. So it's cool that, uh, um, that you talked about it. The other divine intervention piece is, uh, timing and no such thing as, yeah. confidence, but of course you come on on draft night. Are you watching it or, or, or no? <laughs> Uh, no, um, I think it started around seven. I know, uh, we took Marlins, we took a right-handed pitcher out of the university of Minnesota, I believe. So, um, so good for us, you know, hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully, you know, his minor league career maybe is a little shorter than mine and we can get him up to the big leagues and help us win some games there. But, uh, but no, I haven't, uh, haven't turned it on or anything. I just got a few updates on my phone. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Very good. Um, so sometimes, uh, I don't know, I just wonder sometimes if, if everybody turns it on and watches it just to see what your team's doing. I'm sure you'll find out about it either way. But um, I had a buddy just text me as I was trying to get on here. And he's like, hey, just to keep you updated, he sent me like, I don't know, a big long <laughs> the Jay The Jays make a draft pick or something? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He's like, just in case you want to be in the loop, here's what's happening with the Jays. And I'm like, all right, thanks. I appreciate you getting me back in the loop. I have no idea. Drew, Drew does. He's got them written in his hand, I think. And he's there probably, you go. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. probably blowing up over there too. So, um, yeah, great stuff, man. Great insight. Hey, listen, uh, a really good question came in, um, that mm -hmm. I'll read to you. Uh, 
uh, if you could change one thing about the minor leagues, uh, aside from increased pay, what would we, what would you like to see done differently? Um, for an example, in, in parentheses, he's, uh, Jeff has said, uh, more support staff, better access to good food, more games, less games. What things come to mind in terms of uh, your minor, your, um, your minor league experience? I think, um, I think a lot of, not, a, I can't say a lot of teams because I've only, I've played in three, I've played in the minor leagues for three different organizations with the Blue Jays, the Indians, and, um, briefly with the Marlins. Um, I would say you kind of touched on it. I would say um, kind of better access to, I think a lot of the facilities need to be upgraded um, and better access to better food. And I know at the end of my last few years with the Blue Jays, they really started to try to ramp up the nutrition side um, of things. Um, and I think other organizations, Indians as well, and um, the Marlins as well, we're also trying to do that. So I don't know if that's something that Major League Baseball is doing as a whole or if teams are doing it individually. But I think, uh, as you know, from our times in Lansing, you know, the spreads we had and the stuff of the budget just isn't what it is as you move up and especially in the big leagues. But for, I think, organizations to get the best out of their players um, and to help improve them because 99.9% .9 of all major leaguers played some sort of minor league baseball. Um, there's an exception of a couple guys, I think, that signed and went right to the big league. So um, I would feel like you want those players to be um, have the access to, to good food and have access to uh, proper equipment and, and the facility being upgraded. Not saying that it has to be kind of a top notch like the big leagues is, but, um, but there's so many clubhouses that you go into and it's just so small or, or run down or clearly needs to be upgraded that I think could go a long way in, in helping the development of the player um, and just make the minor league experience that much better um, than it is. Yeah, yeah, so many good points. And, and for those of you that haven't worked in the minor leagues, a lot of people have worked with amateur sport and I'm sure they've been exposed to that um, or different sports and, and been exposed to that. I, I've talked about this, not at nauseum, but uh, on a regular basis and including while we're, while we're in the, uh, well, working in baseball, and I just drew this diagram because I'm really good at drawing, but it's uh, <laughs> it, it's 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 a little inverted thing, you know, where uh -huh. the resources it's two triangles, where where you know at the top part it feels inverted sometimes in terms of all the resources that go into Major League Baseball, and then you have the most players down in, in Minor League Baseball, but uh, you're using from a training standpoint or from a therapy mm -hmm. standpoint, it's typically younger trainers, younger therapists who are just coming out, and the 30, 40. 25 year veterans are, are up at the big leagues and I get that that's kind of a path and a journey but I feel like the most impact can really be made in those minor league years you know mm -hmm. where there's more players and and that but all the money and the and the you know the reality of the entertainment business is all at the top so it makes sense from that standpoint but I don't know looking at a way to sort of filter it a little bit differently and you touched on a lot of good points um, when it came to food I know the Blue Jays started overhauling things when, when I was still working there. Uh, and the Indians really did. They, I think they were leading the charge when it came to that, at least in the mm -hmm. Midwest League when we were there. Um, we'd pull into Lake County and, and they'd have mm -hmm. their spread out for their guys. And then, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd order, I don't know, what was it, Little Cedars or something like that? Something, yeah, yeah. Whatever you could get your hands on, really. Yeah, yeah. Until the end of one season that we were there, they they started sending over spread and, and just saying, like, pay us and we'll make sure that your guys get nice food. And I think, it sort of went league wide to sort of enhance things, which is great. You know, you got to, mm -hmm. you know, if we don't change, then, then we just stay the same. And if things stay the same, then they don't change. So it's nice to see organizations investing in some of these things and, um, and, and baseball sort of, you know, moving the old guard. It used to be a sport that was very slow to change. You know, this, this, mm -hmm. this old guy used to be a pretty good sport in baseball. For a long time. <laughs> oh yeah. You'll do a couple Done of many of those. Yeah. 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 Then fire it out there and see, see how it goes. Um, so good to hear, man. Um, in terms of your travel through the, through the national league, uh, fa mm -hmm. favorite yards away from Marlins or away from their um, home? Field? I got to say my favorite place that I've played at so far outside of uh, Marlins park would have to be Wrigley field. Oh, wow. Um, I hit my, I hit my first career home run there, um, which was awesome. Something I'll never forget. Um, and it was really cool too, cause, uh, the fan threw it back right away. So I ended up getting to keep the ball. <laughs> so, I uh, got the ball back right away and, um, it was super cold when we went, but, uh, just the history there and just to be playing there and, and seeing the way the stadium set up and how different it's set up compared to other places like 
um, the New York Mets uh, City Field. That's a beautiful cathedral type um, ballpark where it's built straight up and it's huge. But then at Wrigley, it's kind of built more outwardly. You know, it's not very tall relative um, to the way the stadiums are built now and just the way the history was. I mean, it was pretty cool to to have that experience. Yeah, amazing. And uh, uh, they must not have known it was your first or you would have ended up in like a That's big, I thought big I was going to have to pay for it or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Amazing. And what a what a story. First home run. It was in a win. It wasn't a walk-off though, right? It, it was – No. Yeah, but it was in a win and it, it was, was a win. Yep. Yeah, and it was a one run win and, and you hit it in Wrigley in a cold day. And, and that's not foreign to you. You're from a northern state. You spent a yeah, lot of time right. in the snow. And, uh, and who, who said that uh, Midwesterners in the, in the cold winters couldn't play baseball? Nobody. So right. You, you made it. That's great. What an amazing story. Uh, who, who do, do you remember who the home run was off of? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was off of Cole Hamels. So um, former Cy Young Award winner probably a hall of fame type pit, you know, pitcher. So um, to do it off him too, made it even better. <laughs> oh, wow. What a, yeah, you've done it, man. Amazing to, <laughs> uh, to have that on your resume. Nobody on this call can say that they've hit a home run off Cole Hamels. I don't think, um, <laughs> or at Wrigley field for that matter, or uh, I don't know, have maybe have ever even hit a home run. I think the only <laughs> home run, the only home run that I ever hit was, uh, um, uh, it was at a, at a field that didn't have a fence and the ball just kept rolling. Just kept rolling. And I think I just kept running <laughs> and then that was it. And then I think it might've been runners on base. Uh, but anyway, it, it was, that's it. At not even close to getting a ball thrown back at Wrigley field. That must've been fantastic. Where do you have that ball stored? Uh, it's at my parents' house right now. i um, got a nice little case for it, but i um, going to figure out uh, where I want to, where I want to keep it for the future. But I have, a lot of my old um, memorabilia, some different things. Um, first pro home run, first big league hit. First, it's a lot of things like that still over there and at my parents' house. And going to figure out maybe build a man cave or something, I don't know, and, and kind of display some of this stuff. But Yeah, wait, wait, wait on that until you're done, you know? You don't, don't there you go. There you go. Yourself until you're done because you, you got go. a lot of great stuff ahead of you, man. I can't wait to see you play again uh, on TV. I'll be tuning in. And like I said, I'm going to catch you at one field or another as soon as, as, soon as I Perfect. can. Perfect. You let I, me know. Um, yeah, I will, I will definitely let you know. Um, and uh, and we, can, we can talk afterwards. I got a couple ideas that maybe we can share uh, back and cool. forth. Going back, uh, going back to some of the stuff you talked about earlier, um, just in your off-season uh, training and, and, and your, your, uh, your mental readiness and stuff. I got mm -hmm. a lot of resources and things. If, if you're interested, don't feel like Absolutely. I Absolutely. Um, and then I'm looking, as I looked up from my screen and you're talking about all your memorabilia, I see James's baseball memory box is right there. <laughs> and I have, uh, it's only one box. It's small and none of it is from playing. But I collected uh, hats minor league hats because I always thought the logos were amazing so from the midwest oh, yeah. the time we went to a stadium I a different team I found a way to work with the trainer to get a hat and uh, it'll be up on a display at some point that's maybe, awesome maybe in this basement but hey who knows um all right great as a major league player question just came in uh, as a major league player what are your typical interactions with the therapy staff on a regular day how involved are they with your warm-up cool down routines but um so he's i guess is specific but you can go into strength and say that again what was oh for yeah atc yeah um so it depends i see see the guys every day um when i first get to the ballpark um i you know say hi to the guys and and stuff like that um but it just it depends on when i was i was dealing with a little bit of a hamstring injury last year nothing the hamstring didn't keep me out of any games but um, when that was kind of bugging me, I was obviously in the training room more often. So, um, they were helping me with different, um, different things to help get my body loose. But then after that, I kind of developed a, a routine where, um, I'd get in the hot tub, um, at the ballpark, uh, for about 10 minutes before, um, from there going into the uh, weight room, kind of doing a lot of my soft tissue, uh, mobility type stuff just to get my body loose for the day. And then that's when I would go into my routine of, going to the cage or going to get my early ground balls um, before batting practice starts and stuff like that. And then um, post game, you know, and throughout the day, you know, you, you, as you know, James, you run into everyone and, you know, they're in the dugout with you. And if something small comes up or whatever, work with them then. But then um, after the game, um, again, uh, I kind of developed a routine. I, I like the ice, ice tub for about 10 minutes. Um, but before getting in the ice tub, I would usually do a lot of, some a little bit of soft tissue stuff, maybe touch on a few things here or there that are 
maybe um, a little grungy areas or something, but try not to do too much just because I want my body to kind of rest and recover and, and get ready for the, for the next day. But um, when healthy, you see them less often when you're not as healthy or banged up. I see them a little more often, but um, with the clubhouse, the way it's set up, you see everybody all the time. So, um, you know, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, your your experiences are are warranted. You know, uh, we we talk a lot about like integrated models and these kinds of things and being able to step in uh, in and out of various roles. I always found it um, um, super valuable to be able to rely on the strength coach to do to cover a little bit off in the training room in terms of like you know just taking little things like like being able to wrap an ice bag or, or wrap a tent mm -hmm. around somebody uh and then from an atc standpoint it is divided in terms of what your rules are which makes sense because everybody's not everywhere um but i always like that integrated model get out on the third baseline first baseline help out the strength coaches during warm-up um, mm -hmm. and do those kinds of things and just see how guys are moving and those kinds of things. It's not unavailable, but in the big leagues, typically I think what happens is the, uh, the trainers stay in the training room and the, and the strength coaches mm -hmm. go out on the field. Yeah. With all yeah. The work. yeah. That's about, that's about how it goes in baseball, but that's not, not to say that has to be that way. Um, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, um, yeah, you talk on, on some of those things, a lot of good resources, uh, in major league baseball. What, what does the staff look like with the Marlins? How big is the medical staff? What, uh, what practitioners Let's do you guys um, So we have our, our head, head trainer and then two assistants and then a, um, a PA as well. Um, and, and then another um, kind of, a, I guess, so probably about, probably about six guys total. Yeah. Um, is I was just getting to new, know the new staff. We're kind of have, um, some new, new guys this year. Um, so the first few weeks of spring training, I was trying to get to know them a little bit more and, and, and stuff like that in their backgrounds. But obviously then we got kind of cut short. So, um, so obviously a lot bigger than in the minor leagues where there's just one, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, we're fortunate obviously in the big leagues to get a lot more and, and I don't know, maybe it would help, uh, minor league, uh, strength coaches and trainers to maybe have a little more, more help just because you're dealing with the same size team as the, at the big league level, you know, but it's just usually just yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, an interesting one. And, and one that, uh, that, that certainly from uh, experience, I, I, I acknowledged and, and sort of wondered about uh, during my career in baseball. And then afterwards, if uh, um, in the minor leagues, you were there as a minor leaguer, it's the same almost as a player as it is as a staff. You have a lot mm -hmm. of things to do outside of, of just game coverage, you know. So therapy mm -hmm. staff and training staff, you're making flights and, and helping mm -hmm. people. With, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. With all the other things for, for people traveling, hotel bookings, grocery shopping on the road, these kinds of things that, that the big league guys don't have to do. But the big league guys have to have to answer a lot more bells in terms of, uh, you know, front office staff being in and out of the training room, wondering what's going mm -hmm. on, big decisions, big money on the line, these kinds of things, wins and losses, all these kinds of things. But um, really good stuff to, to appreciate you giving us the insight into how it works um, from, from a big leaguer now. Amazing to uh, – every time I see your name, and Jason was great. He'd keep me up to date all the time when you were with the Blue Jays. <laughs> Bert's getting, Bert just got called up. He's going to be up. He's going to play tonight. I was ecstatic, ecstatic to hear that, man. Just to, um, what, what a good guy and, and a hard worker, and nobody in the world deserves it more than you. So – uh, congratulations. I know it's a little late, but uh, congratulations. No, no, all good. All good. And I look forward to this thing. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be there. I, I can't wait to see you play live again, man. What a, what yeah. a great oh, guy. Yeah. This, this is the, uh, this is the, um, not even to compare, not even to compare, but like the, the hustle and the amount of effort that went into everything that you did and do, I can assume is just uh, it, it, you leave nothing out there and then come back tomorrow and, and do it again. This kind of, uh, worry about nothing. Just how I was how I was brought up to, to play the game and, and and to you know do my best to live my life that way so yeah well wow. amazing uh, amazing insight and you've given us so much just from uh, from your experience and, and time tonight really appreciate you being here for everybody else who's here um, obviously we, we uh, um, just got a message saying we should have a let's chat which is you know the name of this thing field trip to go see you play which I wouldn't be <laughs> That anybody, sounds great. Anybody who's on board <laughs> for that one, when uh, when this thing allows, let's uh, let's hunker down and make that happen. Uh, we'll catch you. We drove from Florida, and and the idea again was like, okay, 
if this COVID thing hadn't ever evolved or happened, I was going to drive from Florida all the way up and catch a bunch of major league parks because that was one thing when I was working in yeah. baseball. You just can't get to major league parks because you're going to minor league parks all the time. And the Marlins Park is definitely on my list. So, uh, but anyway, great, great idea, uh, Kat. I, I think that uh, you'll have some people that are interested in that. And John, maybe by then we'll have our T-shirts made and we'll just have like uh, your name on them as well. So that'll perfect. Be- that was, Sounds uh, good. Let's chat with uh, Birdie on the back, or maybe Birdie on the front. How cool was that? Uh, was that Players Day that they? I don't know when that started, but you had like your nicknames on the jerseys, and yeah, uh, you had that posted up. Birdman was uh, Birdman. Was on- yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, that was awesome. That was a fun, fun weekend. Um, uh, didn't. Yeah, I mean, it was awesome. A lot of fun to be able to. To I wasn't a. It was the jerseys. I don't know if you saw. I felt weird wearing all white, and uh, so I don't know what this year if we were. Obviously, we had it planned again, but I don't know what jerseys that would the color scheme was going to be like this year. But it was really cool to kind of a change of pace, and I think the fans really enjoyed it too. Yeah, the uh, the number of times that that Marlin has changed shape and and the colors of <laughs> that organization. I don't know. Maybe it's just Miami. You need to keep it fresh because it's a uh, it's that. Yeah, kind of there you thing. go. Yeah, I feel like they're getting into the uh, fluorescent colors now too, or maybe I missed the boat. That happened a long time ago. But anyway, I don't know. Yeah, if anybody a has. Bit. Uh, <laughs> if anybody has any questions for for john uh, i'm not going to keep him here too long it's almost uh we're passing an hour so i appreciate you taking the time out i know the dog's probably got to get out and and you know you're sitting around you got to go do some things you're allowed out now so that's nice lucky for that's you. nice nicer we have uh yeah. one two three four five more days before we're allowed out so i'll catch you uh, at that point but um uh, big league from from the minor leagues to the big leagues uh um some lessons that you've learned in terms of maintenance from various trainers or various strength coaches, does anything resonate that are sort of like uh, take homes that you've heard or just the way that you take um, has developed? I think, I think it's just as, as I've, I've, maybe it's been, you know, around a while, but I just didn't know, um, you know, just my, you know, we called it getting activated for the day, right. Getting your body going, you know, in college, I didn't really do anything. It was, you know, I was 19, 20 years old. Um, first few years of pro ball when, you know, getting with the Blue Jays kind of wanting us to start to develop that routine. And that routine went from maybe spending five minutes in the, in the weight room or the training room to kind of get my body going to the day through to the, uh, getting my body going for the day. Um, to now I, I spend, I don't try to do too much, but I can spend 25 or 30 minutes kind of doing different things, um, on a daily basis, uh, just to get going and just to, um, make sure that, um, I'm kind of preparing my body the best I can so that I can prevent injuries. And, um, so I think that's definitely developed over the past 10 years of playing pro ball. All right. That's, that's, that's that's key. Cause I was going to go like, just do this. (laughs) Right. Yeah. See how you go. That's how I used to, that's how I used to do it. (laughs) I think, I think we all did. And I, and I probably instructed that at some point and, and Hey, maybe it'll come back around. It's like history repeats itself anyway. So at some point we're going to move back to like the static thing being really, really good before you do stuff. But, um, uh, I was on a a call earlier this week and we were talking about prep. So it's really cool that you bring it up, uh, you know, doing how, how valuable that prep is, um, do, do your mornings like before you get to the field typically you'll go to the field around what time for for a night game like midday usually kind of? around around yeah usually around noon yeah, i usually go to the field and, and grab lunch um eat at the field and just kind of start my day that way but yeah probably usually around noon for a seven o'clock game yeah and this is a, this is a guy that uh i wouldn't expect anything less from from you <laughs> i'm sure some guys are rolling in around three or four which is fine but mm-hmm. uh uh, you've spent your time making yourself into what you are and keep with your routines. I think that that goes a long way. Um, when you first wake up in the morning, do you do anything or is that just kind of like home time, chill out, do your thing. And then you start your activation, like baseball stuff uh, when you get to the field. Yeah. My, my mornings are usually, uh, I like my mornings to be pretty slow. Um, so I kind of get up and just kind of um, enjoy, you know, if I have family in town, maybe go grab breakfast with them or um, kind of just use that time to, kind of be be still and kind of just watch some TV or, or just relax a little bit. And um, and then usually um, before I head to the field, I'll, I'll take a shower, kind of just that moment for me is just kind of helps wake me up a little bit and also kind of transitions my mindset into what I'm going to do to start my day. And then, um, yeah, when I get to the field, that's when physically I start to kind of get a little bit more 
um, prepared. Yeah, very, very cool, man. Um, again, I really appreciate your insight um, into your life, into your professional um, endeavors, your career, your draft. Like this is massive in terms of knowledge for all of us. Uh, as to what it takes to do what you do um, and, and what it takes on our end to support you in that. Um, I, again, uh, always, always, always looked up to your work ethic and, and have taken elements of, of the way you carried yourself into, into a career here. And, and you know, um, going back, this is, this is the impetus for asking you to be on is uh, all the utmost respect for having you uh, as, a, as an athlete and now you know, as, as a friend and somebody I can call to say, Hey, do you want to chat and, with a bunch of people that you don't know? Cause this will be, <laughs> <laughs> it's been great. It's been fun. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, man. Time flies. So, uh, I'll, I'll let you go. I'll be in touch with you. I'm going to reach out cause I got a couple ideas that I want to run past you anyway. And, uh, this has Perfect. been, amazing. this has been amazing to, to get inside the life of uh, an MLB athlete. Um, and, and we wish you the best moving forward and, um, uh, hope the season gets off you know, off the ground here in the not too distant future. And, and I'm on it. Like, seriously, if you want a stuffed animal, I can do that. And, uh, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you might have people on here that actually would donate now too, because they're like, Hey, I know uh, John Birdie was on and I want to go see him play. So let's <laughs> start a John Birdie uh, um, stuffy section. Okay. Awesome. Like Sal's pal. Sounds great. Like, like Sal Fasano used to have. There you go. Yeah, that's right. That's Birdie's, right. Buddy, Birdie's buddies. How about that? There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. There you go. All right, man. Well, listen, really, really appreciate it. Not to minimize your time and effort. Um, keep it up, man. Love, love seeing you from a distance. Love being in the dugout with you, but I uh, look forward to seeing you again um, down the road playing live. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. And thanks for everyone for, for, for listening, for showing up. And it's, it's been a lot of fun. I hope, hope it's helped. Yeah, definitely will. Definitely has. Um, and uh, for everybody else who's on here, this has been Let's Chat and Athletic Therapy Roundtable Session 21. The quiz is up in the chat. Uh, I will hit stop now and I'll be hanging out for a few minutes after this. If anybody wants to, to hang on, um, John, again, man, thank you so much. I'll let you go and um, we'll catch up in the next couple of days. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. All right. Talk to you. Good night, everybody. Bye.